In the vast tapestry of Old West lore, few figures stand as tall and enigmatic as the legendary Doc Holliday. Beyond the haze of gun smoke and the echoes of saloon piano melodies, Holiday's story emerges as a compelling saga of resilience, friendship, and a relentless pursuit of a life well lived in the face of adversity. Saddle up, for we are about to embark on a journey into the heart of the Wild West, where the lines between myth and reality blur, and the legend of Doc Holiday comes to life. I found him a loyal friend and good company. He was a dentist whom necessity had made a gambler, a gentleman whom disease had made a vagabond, a philosopher whom life had made a caustic wit, a long, lean, blonde fellow nearly dead with consumption, and, at the same time, the most skillful gambler and nerviest, speediest, deadliest man with a six-gun I ever knew. Wyatt Earp, speaking of Doc Holliday. Doc Holliday was a gambler, vagabond, gentleman, and gunfighter. A friend to Wyatt Earp, he was deputized in Tombstone, Arizona, before the famous gunfight at the O.K. Corral. Unveiling the layers of his background, we discover that Doc Holliday's father, Henry B. Holliday, wasn't just any man. He was a skilled pharmacist and a military veteran who played significant roles in conflicts like the Cherokee Indian War, the Mexican-American War, and the Civil War, where he rose to the rank of major in the Confederate Army. After serving in the Mexican-American War, Major Holliday returned to Griffin, Georgia, with an orphaned Mexican boy named Francisco Hidalgo. In 1849, he wed Alice Jane McKay, and in the following year, the couple welcomed a daughter, Martha Eleonora, who sadly succumbed to infancy. On August 14, 1851, John Henry Doc Holliday was born. He was baptized at the First Presbyterian Church of Griffin in 1852. In 1857, Major Holliday inherited land in Valdosta, Georgia, prompting the family's move. In Lowndes County, John Henry attended Valdosta Institute, immersing himself in studies that included Greek, Latin, and French. His father's prominence in the community soared as Major Holliday assumed roles like mayor, secretary of the county agricultural society, and superintendent of local elections. Tragically, when John was just 15, his mother died of consumption, later called tuberculosis, on September 16, 1866. This was a terrible blow to the teenager, as his relationship with his mother was very close. The blow was compounded by his father's swift remarriage just three months later, marking a poignant chapter in the young man's tumultuous journey. The family's standing in the community and the establishment of the Pennsylvania College of Dental Surgery by his cousin Robert Holliday likely influenced John's career path. In 1870, he enrolled in the Philadelphia-based college and on March Bierst, 1872, obtained a Doctor of Dental Surgery degree alongside 26 fellow graduates. Post-graduation, Doc Holliday initiated his dental practice under the guidance of Dr. Arthur C. Ford in Atlanta, Georgia. Though educated and respected, John Henry was a hot-tempered Southerner who was quick to use a gun. On one occasion, African-American men were swimming in his favorite swimming hole, and the outraged Doc Holliday started shooting over their heads. While one of the black men shot back, no one was killed. This seems to be the first account of Doc's love affair with the six-shooter. Soon after starting his dental practice, Doc Holliday received a grim diagnosis of tuberculosis, likely contracted from his late mother or his adopted Mexican brother, who succumbed to the same illness. Advised by physicians of his limited time left, he heeded the suggestion to relocate to a drier climate for a chance at prolonging his life. In October 1873, Doc Holliday packed up and headed for Dallas, Texas, the railroad's end at the time. 
Contrary accounts suggest that his move was prompted by a shooting incident in Georgia, as recounted by Bat Masterson in 1907. Initially, Doc worked with another dentist named Dr. John A. Seagar in Dallas. However, when coughs ravaged his body during complex dental procedures, his business declined and Holiday was forced to find another way to make a living. A distinctive figure in the Western landscape, Doc stood out as a highly educated and refined man, flaunting fluency in Latin, adept piano skills, impeccable fashion sense, and the genteel manners of a Southern gentleman. His intelligence made him a natural at gambling, which quickly became his means of support, where he was both an active participant and a poker and faro dealer. However, Doc was also very sad when he learned that he was dying. He was erratic, a heavy drinker, and probably inclined to live a life without fear of death. The thin and weak doctor knew that gambling was a dangerous profession, requiring him to have enough means to protect himself. Dedicated, he began practicing with a pistol and a wicked long knife, honing his skills. On May 12, 1874, Holiday and 12 others were indicted in Dallas for illegal gambling. The inaugural clash erupted on January 2, 1875, as a disagreement with local saloon keeper Charles Austin escalated into a violent encounter. Despite the discharge of several shots, neither party sustained injuries, and both found themselves behind bars, a spectacle reported by the Dallas Weekly Herald. At first, the locals thought the gunfight was just fun until a few days later, when Doc had another disagreement, suddenly killing a prominent citizen with two precisely aimed bullets. Evading the pursuing army, Holiday quickly sought refuge in Jacksboro, Texas, a wild and lawless town near an army post. There, he assumed the role of a faro dealer, sporting both shoulder and hip holsters, accompanied by his trusty knife. Becoming an expert gunman, he participated in three more gunfights in a short period of time. Although he put a man down in these gunfights, no action was taken against him in the lawless cowherd town. However, in the summer of 1876, disagreement again led to violence, resulting in Doc shooting a soldier at Fort Richardson, prompting an investigation by the United States government. A reward was offered for his capture, and he was aggressively pursued by the Army, Texas Rangers, U.S. Marshals, local lawmen, and simple citizens anxious to collect the bounty. Aware of the imminent hanging if captured, Doc fled for his life to Apache country in Kansas Territory, now Colorado. His journey through Pueblo, Leadville, Georgetown, and Central City left behind three more corpses. Eventually finding a semblance of stability in Denver, he adopted the alias Tom Mackey while dealing faro at Babbitt's house. Relatively unknown for a while, that changed when he got involved in an argument with Bud Ryan, well-known gambling tough. The ensuing brawl saw Doc wielding his lethal knife, nearly severing Ryan's head. Although Ryan survived, his face and neck bore the scars of the brutal encounter. Public resentment forced Doc to run again, first to Wyoming, then New Mexico, and finally back to Texas, where he would meet Wyatt Earp and Big Nose Kate at Fort Griffin. Holiday left when he heard that gold had been discovered in Wyoming. On February 5, 1876, he hurried to Cheyenne, Wyoming. He found work as an agent for Bab's partner, Thomas Miller, who owned the Bella Union Saloon. In the autumn of 1876, Miller moved the Bella Union to Deadwood, South Dakota, site of the gold rush in the Dakota Territory, and Holiday went with him. Holiday then moved to Fort Griffin, Texas. While dealing cards at John Shancy's saloon, Doc happened to meet Mary Catherine Elder Harrony, who went by many names but was best known as Big Nose Kate. While the dance hall girl and prostitute was attractive, 
She had a prominent nose. Kate was tough, stubborn, and had a hot temper, which was very similar to Doc. She said she worked the business because she liked it, belonging to no man nor any house. At the same time, while traveling from Dodge City, Kansas, Wyatt Earp was on the trail of a notorious train robber, Dave Rudabaugh. After being issued an acting commission as U.S. Deputy Marshal to pursue the outlaw out of state, he followed Rudabaugh's trail for 400 miles. Wyatt quickly went to the town's largest saloon, Shancy's, to ask about Rudabaugh. Owner John Shancy said that Rudabaugh had been there earlier in the week, but didn't know where he was bound. He directed Wyatt to Doc Holliday, who had played cards with Rudabaugh. Skeptical about engaging with Holliday due to Doc's well-known aversion to lawmen, Wyatt approached him one evening at Shancy's with caution. To his surprise, Holliday showed a willingness to converse. Doc shared his belief that Rudabaugh had retraced his steps to Kansas. Wyatt quickly passed this information on to Bat Masterson, the sheriff in Dodge City, and this information was instrumental in Rudabaugh's arrest. Thanks to this unexpected meeting, this unlikely couple formed a lasting friendship at Shancy's over the years. In 1877, Doc dealt cards to a local bully named Ed Bailey, who was accustomed to having his way without question. Bailey was completely unimpressed with Doc's reputation. To annoy him, he kept picking up discarded things and looking at them. Looking at the discards was strictly prohibited by the rules of Western poker, a violation that could force the player to forfeit the pot. Though Holliday warned Bailey twice, the bully ignored him and picked up the discards again. This time, Doc raked in the pot without showing his hand or saying a word. Bailey, reacting with violence, drew his pistol, but before he could fire, Doc's deadly knife inflicted a grievous wound. Bloodied and sprawled across the table, Bailey's fate was sealed. Knowing his actions were legitimate self-defense, Doc did not run away. However, he was still detained in a local hotel room because the town did not have a prison. Whether in defiance of justice or due to the unsettled nature of the frontier, a vigilante group sought vengeance against Holiday. Recognizing the imminent threat, Big Nose K to devisit a daring plan for Doc's liberation. Setting fire to an old shed, it began to burn rapidly, threatening to engulf the entire town. As others gathered to fight the fire, she confronted the policemen guarding Holiday with a pistol in each hand disarmed the guard, and the two quickly escaped. Dodge City, Kansas. After spending approximately a month in Fort Griffin, Earp made his way back to Fort Clark. Early in 1878, he went to Dodge City, serving as assistant city marshal under Charlie Bassett. During the summer of 1878, Holliday and Horony also arrived in Dodge City, where they stayed at Deacon Cox's boarding house as Dr. and Mrs. John H. Holliday. Eager to resume dentistry, Holliday placed an advertisement in the local paper. Dentistry, J. H. Holliday Dentist, very respectfully offers his professional services to the citizens of Dodge City and surrounding country during the summer. Office at room number 24, Dodge House. Where satisfaction is not given, money will be refunded. Touched by Kate's support, Doc made a commitment to her happiness, renouncing gambling and reinstating his dental practice. In return, Kate promised to give up the life of prostitution and stop hanging about the saloons. However, the constraints of respectable living proved unbearable for Kate, prompting her to announce her return to the vibrant world of dance halls and gambling dens. Consequently, the two split up, as they were destined to do many times during the remainder of Doc's life. Doc decided to return to gambling, regularly going to the Alhambra and dealing cards at the Long Branch Saloon. Although the people of Dodge City thought Wyatt and Doc's friendship was strange, Wyatt ignored them, and Doc remained law-abiding while in Dodge City. 
One night, while dealing faro at the Long Branch Saloon, Doc found himself entangled with a group of rowdy Texas cowboys who had arrived in town with a cattle herd. Exhausted from weeks on the trail, the cowboys, led by Wyatt's past adversary Ed Morrison and Toby Driscoll, unleashed chaos on Front Street, firing guns and shattering shop windows. Upon entering the Long Branch Saloon, they began harassing patrons. When Wyatt entered the front door, he came face to face with several awaiting gun barrels. Stepping forward, Morrison sneered, Pray and jerk your gun! Your time has come, Erp! Suddenly, a voice emanated from behind Morrison. No, friend. You draw or throw your hands up. The assertive words belonged to Doc. His revolver pressed against Morrison's temple. Doc had been engrossed in a card game in the back room, disrupted by the chaos unfolding in the front. With a stern warning, any of you bastards pulls a gun and your leader here loses what's left of his brains. The cowboys promptly lowered their weapons. Wyatt wrapped Morrison over the head with his long barrel colt. Then, relieving Driscoll and Morrison of their arms, he ushered them to the Dodge City Jail. Wyatt never forgot that Doc Holliday saved his life that night in Dodge City. Reflecting on the incident later, Wyatt remarked, The only way anyone could have appreciated the feeling I had for Doc after the Driscoll-Morrison business would have been to have stood in my boots when Doc came through the Long Branch doorway. Later, in their ongoing love-hate relationship, Kate and Doc had another of their frequent violent quarrels. Furious, Doc immediately saddled his horse and went out to Trinidad, Colorado. There, he became entangled in a confrontation with a young gambler named Kid Colton, who, either seeking reputation or unaware of Doc's marksmanship, ended up with two bullets in the dusty street. Not wanting to linger, Doc rode on to Las Vegas, New Mexico, where, in the late summer of 1879, he hung out his shingle for the last time. However, this venture proved short-lived, as Doc changed course and purchased a saloon a few weeks later. In late August 1879, Doc found himself embroiled in a dispute with a local gunman named Mike Gordon. The two took the argument to the street where Doc politely invited Gordon to start shooting whenever he felt like it. Gordon accepted the offer, meeting his demise with three fatal shots to the belly. Once again, a venga fuel mob gathered, intent on lynching Holiday, prompting Doc to retreat to Dodger City. However, he arrived only to find that Wyatt had gone to a new silver strike in Tombstone, Arizona. At the same time, Doc also didn't see Big Nose Kate in Dodge City. With no compelling reason to remain, Doc decided to set his sights westward, embarking on a journey bound for Tombstone. Tombstone, Arizona. Unknown to Doc. Big nose. Kate was also en route to the new boomtown of Tombstone, and the two ran into each other in Prescott, Arizona. Doc found success at the gaming tables, amassing winnings of $40,000, and Kate gladly kept him company. When Doc arrived in Tombstone, not only did he find Wyatt, but all of the Earp brothers, including Morgan from Montana James, who traveled with Wyatt from Dodge City, and Virgil from Prescott, where he had just been made a deputy U.S. Marshal. The Earp brothers were involved in silver mining, with James dealing faro at Vogan's saloon. Virgil, taking on the role of acting city marshal, swore in Morgan as an officer. As the Earps settled in Tombstone, Tensions escalated with the notorious Clanton gang, who strongly opposed their presence. Old man Clanton, his sons, Ike, Finn, and Billy, the McClory brothers, Frank and Tom, Curly Bill Brocious, John Ringo, and their followers immediately expressed their discontent. Doc Holliday became a valuable ally in the Earps' conflict with the cowboy faction. Shortly thereafter, Kate managed a boarding house in Globe, Arizona, located some 180 miles from Tombstone. However, she was known to often stay with Doc when she visited. In October 1880, Doc found himself in a dispute with Johnny Tyler at the Oriental Saloon. 
While Tyler hastily left the premises, Doc continued arguing with the saloon owner, Milt Joyce. As tensions escalated, the altercation turned violent, with a drunken Doc firing shots that struck Joyce in the hand and his bartender, Parker, in the toe of his left foot. In retaliation, Milt struck Doc on the head with a pistol. Subsequently, Doc faced arrest and charges of assault with a weapon. Found guilty, he was fined $1.20 for assault and battery, along with $11.25 in court costs. When Big Nose Kate visited Holiday, they were known to have frequent arguments, most of which were not serious until Kate got drunk. Her drunkenness often escalated to abuse, and in early 1881, Doc had finally had enough and threw her out. On March 15th of the same year, four masked individuals attempted a stagecoach holdup near contention, resulting in the deaths of the stage driver and a passenger. Seizing the opportunity, the cowboy faction promptly accused Doc Holliday of involvement. The investigating sheriff found Kate in the midst of a drunken episode, still resentful of being thrown out by Doc. Feeding her even more whiskey, the sheriff persuaded her to sign an affidavit that Doc had been one of the masked highwaymen and killed the stage driver. While Kate sobered up, the Earps gathered witnesses to establish Doc's alibi. Upon realizing the consequences of her actions, Kate recanted her statement, leading to the dismissal of charges. But for Doc, this was the last straw for Kate, and by giving her some money, he put her on a stage out of town. Throughout the summer of 1881, threats against the Earp brothers from the Clanton faction intensified. As they were referred to, the cowboys were often heard telling barroom stories of how they would send Wyatt Earp to Boot Hill. On Tuesday, October 25th, Ike Clanton spent the day getting drunk, moving from one saloon to the next, and making threats against the Earps and Holiday to any who would listen. That evening, he joined a card game at the Occidental Saloon with Tom McClory. An angry Doc Holliday, who had heard of the boasts, confronted him. I heard you're going to kill me, Ike, he said. Get out your gun and commence. Virgil, a U.S. Deputy Marshal, Wyatt, appointed Acting City Marshal by Virgil, and Morgan, also a sworn officer, were present during the confrontation. Virgil told Doc and Ike that he would arrest them if they continued the argument. Though boasting violence throughout the day, Clanton was unarmed. And finally, Virgil drew Holiday away. But Clanton followed, promising to kill you tomorrow when the others come to town. Spotting Wyatt on the streets, the fired-up Clanton continued. Tell your consumptive friend, your Arizona nightingale, he's a dead man tomorrow. To which Wyatt just turned and replied, Don't you tangle with Doc Holliday. He'll kill you before you've begun. Ike's parting shot was, Get ready for a showdown. On October 26, 1881, an overcast and windy day, the Earps, anticipating trouble, rose early. Virgil, observing from his hotel window, witnessed Billy Clanton's arrival in town with friend Billy Claiborne. They met the McClory brothers and Ike Clanton on Allen Street. Ike was looking for Holiday, but before he could find him, Virgil and Morgan confronted him. Armed with a shotgun, Ike exchanged heated words with the Earps, and when he raised his rifle, Virgil subdued him confiscated the weapon, and brought him before Justice of the Peace Wallace. The judge imposed a $27.50 fine on Ike for carrying firearms in the city. Meanwhile, Wyatt and Tom McClory coincidentally met at the judge's door, resulting in a literal collision. Though Wyatt apologized, McClory insulted him, and in return, Wyatt brought his gun down on McClory's head. Later that morning, the cowboys gathered at Spangenberg's, a gunsmith shop. Subsequently, Frank McClory rode his horse onto the boardwalk, causing pedestrians to scatter outside the gunsmith shop. Wyatt took hold of the horse's reins, guiding it to the streets as McClory hurled profanities. Following this tense encounter, the outlaws retreated around the corner off Allen Street, setting the stage for an inevitable clash. 
Several members of the town citizens committee offered assistance to the Earp brothers, but thanking them, Wyatt said it was his and his brother's responsibility as law officers. Then John Behan, the county sheriff, appeared pronouncing, Ike Clanton and his crew are on Fremont Street talking gun talk. Ike Clanton, the two McClory's, Billy Clanton and Billy Claiborne, met in a vacant lot planning to bushwhack Doc Holliday, who passed that way every morning. Virgil, acting as chief marshal, agreed to intervene, but insisted that Behan accompany him. Behan dismissively laughed, stating, Hell, this is your fight, not mine. The cowboys were taken aback when the Earps, including Doc, unexpectedly appeared. As they proceeded to the O.K. Corral, witnesses noted that the three Earp brothers wore black attire with stern expressions, while Doc, stylishly dressed in gray, whistled casually. The confrontation unfolded 90 yards down an alley from the O.K. Corral between Fly's photo gallery and Jersey's livery stable. Although the Earps passed by the O.K. Corral but cut through the alley, where they found the troublemakers waiting at the other end. You are under arrest for attempting to disturb the peace, Virgil announced. As a senior officer, he displayed only a non-threatening walking stick, giving Doc his shotgun. The rustlers tightened, and Morgan and Doc simultaneously braced for action. Hold on, I don't want that, cried Virgil. In the ensuing chaos, which transpired within approximately 30 seconds, the gunfire erupted when Billy Clanton and Frank McClory readied their pistols. It is unknown who fired the first shot, but Doc's bullet was the first to hit home, tearing through Frank McClory's belly and sending McClory's shot wild through Wyatt's coattail. Billy Clanton fired at Virgil, but his shot went astray when he was hit with Morgan's shot through his ribcage. Billy Claiborne promptly fled at the sound of gunfire, disappearing from sight. In a state of panic, Ike Clanton discarded his weapon and begged for mercy. Fight or get out like Claiborne, Wyatt yelled and watched Ike desert his brother, Billy, as he ran towards the door of the photography shop. However, Ike drew a concealed gun, firing a final round at Wyatt before vanishing. The gunshot distracted Morgan, enabling Tom McClory to wound Morgan in the side. Doc instantly countered, blowing Tom away with blasts from both barrels of his shotgun. In his dying moments, Billy Clanton blindly fired into the enveloping gun smoke, striking Virgil's leg. Wyatt responded by delivering multiple shots into Billy. Subsequently, silence fell, prompting townspeople to emerge from their homes and shops. The wagons were to carry the wounded Morgan and Virgil to their respective homes, and the doctors followed. The brief 30-second confrontation claimed the lives of Billy Clanton, Frank McClory, and Tom McClory. Virgil Earp sustained a leg injury, while Morgan suffered a shoulder wound. As Wyatt, still dazed, stood amidst the aftermath, Sheriff Behan arrived, informing him of his arrest. The Earps and Doc Holliday faced murder charges, yet it was ultimately determined that their actions were lawful. On January 17, 1882, a supposedly famous confrontation occurred between Wyatt, Doc, and John Ringo. Some accounts suggest that John Ringo issued a challenge to the Earp brothers and Holliday. However, this cannot be true as Virgil and Morgan were incapacitated with painful wounds from the shootout. Consequently, even if Ringo extended a challenge, the risk was minimal as there was little chance the Earps could accept. The Earps also knew that Ringo had been drinking heavily and that the whiskey was talking. On March 18, 1882, the cowboy gang targeted Morgan Earp as he played pool at Campbell and Hatch's saloon. A gunshot rang out from the darkness of the alley, striking Morgan in the back. His body, clad in one of Doc Holliday's suits, was sent to his parents in Colton, California, for burial. Two days later, the Earp party encountered Frank Stilwell and Ike Clanton at the Tucson Railroad Station, and Wyatt chased Stilwell down the track, filling him full of holes. A coroner's jury identified Wyatt and Warren Earp, Doc Holliday, Texas Jack Vermillion, and Sherman McMasters as the individuals responsible for Stilwell's death, leading to warrants for their arrest. Earp sought vengeance on the men who shot Virgil and killed Morgan, and killing Stilwell was just his first step, and Doc Holliday rode beside him. 
Hearing that Pete Spence was at his wood camp in the Dragoons, Wyatt and his men swiftly set out on March 21, 1882. However, instead of Pete Spencer, they encountered Florentino Cruz. The apprehensive Cruz divulged the identities of all those involved in Morgan's murder, including himself. Earp and his men filled Cruz with bullet holes. The Earp group ventured forth once more, crossing paths with Curly Bill Brocious and eight of his cohorts near Iron Springs on March 24, 1882. A firefight ensued, resulting in Curly Bill's demise and Johnny Barnes sustaining a wound that proved fatal later on. In just over a year, the Earp Posse, in collaboration with Doc Holliday, eliminated a roster of adversaries, including Old Man Clanton, Billy Clanton, Frank McClory, Tom McClory, Frank Stilwell, Indian Charlie, Dixie Gray, Florentino Cruz, Johnny Barnes, Jim Crane, Harry Head, Bill Leonard, Joe Hill, Luther King, Charlie Snow, Billy Lang, Zwing Hunt, Billy Grounds, and Hank Swilling. Pete Spence turned himself into the authorities where he could hide in the prison. In May 1882, Wyatt and Doc left Tombstone, swearing they would never return but still vowed vengeance on Ringo, Clanton, Spence, and Swilling if they could find them. Riding their horses to Silver City, New Mexico, they sold them, rode a stage to Deming, and boarded a train for Colorado. Arrives in Colorado. Shortly after he arrived in Denver, Doc was arrested by a man named Perry Mallon. Some believed Mallon to be kin to Johnny Tyler, a former adversary of Holiday and an aspiring gunslinger whom Doc had expelled from Tombstone. On May 22, 1882, as Doc languished in jail, the Denver Republican disseminated the following report. Holiday has a big reputation as a fighter and has probably put more rustlers and cowboys under the sod than any other man in the West. He had been the terror of the lawless element in Arizona and, with the Erpus, was the only man brave enough to face the bloodthirsty crowd which has made the name of Arizona a stench in the nostrils of decent men. Mallon told the paper that he was standing alongside when Curly Bill Brocious was killed. Doc related his thoughts. Eight rustlers rose from behind the bank and poured from thirty-five to forty shots at us. Our escape was miraculous. The shots cut our clothes and saddles and killed one horse but did not hit us. I think we would have been killed if God Almighty wasn't on our side. Wyatt Earp turned loose with a shotgun and killed Curly Bill. The eight men in the gang which attacked us were all outlaws, for each of whom a big reward has been offered. If Mallon was alongside Curly Bill when he was killed, he was with one of the worst gangs of murderers and robbers in the country. Eventually, Doc's extradition concerns related to Arizona were resolved. On May 30, 1882, the Rocky Mountain News printed, Doc Holliday's case was finally disposed of by Governor Pitkin yesterday, His Excellency deciding that he could not honor the requisition from Arizona. The district attorney's office was represented by Honorable I.E. Barnum, assistant district attorney, who was accompanied on his visit to the governor by Deputy Sheriff Linton and Sheriff Paul of Arizona. Among others present were Deputy Sheriff Masterson of Trinidad and several friends of Holiday. Leaving Denver, Doc reportedly journeyed towards Pueblo, Colorado. However, on July 14, 1882, amid claims that Doc Holliday was still within the confines of Colorado, a teamster named John Yost made a chilling discovery in the Arizona Territory. A lifeless body lying among the branches of an oak tree east of the Dragoon Mountains was found, with a bullet entering the head at the right temple and passing through the top of the head. The deceased was none other than John Ringo, a sworn adversary of Doc Holliday. Despite efforts by Bat Masterson, Warren Earp, and certain newspaper associates to construct an alibi, asserting that Doc had never departed Colorado, the reality was that Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday had indeed returned to Arizona. While there, they met familiar faces, Fred Dodge, Oregon Smith, 
Johnny Green, John Magger, and possibly Lou Cooley. The group had spotted Ringo, and next, he was found dead. Doc then made his way to Leadville, leading a tranquil and uneventful existence until the fateful afternoon of August 19, 1884. At approximately 5 p.m., Doc found himself in Hyman's saloon. As Billy Allen entered, Doc, aware that trouble loomed due to Allen's reputation, swiftly drew his pistol, sending a bullet sailing over Allen's head, narrowly avoiding him. Attempting to escape, Allen stumbled over the threshold, falling onto his hands and knees. Seizing the opportunity, Doc fired again, this time hitting Allen in the right arm. Holiday would have shot him again, but the bartender rushed up from behind and clamped down on his gun hand. Merely days later, the Leadville Daily Democrat, on August 26, 1884, reported, in part, the public sentiment, which has nothing to do with the law, is largely in favor of Holiday. The manlier class of the community not only appreciate this, but have little criticism to make as to his actions in connection with his trouble with Allen. Despite his popularity, Holiday faced a protracted legal process. However, on March 28, 1885, a jury acquitted him of the charges of shooting or attempted murder. The courthouse in Leadville today still shows the arrests of the infamous gunfighter and gambler Doc Holliday in its jail records. By the winter of 1885, Holiday, fearing a bout of pneumonia in the city in the clouds, migrated to Denver. Although his health did not improve in Denver, he had the opportunity to reunite with his old friend, Wyatt Earp, in late winter 1886 as they crossed paths in the lobby of the Windsor Hotel. Described by Sadie Marcus as a skeletal figure with a persistent cough and unsteady legs, Holiday faced the challenges of declining health. Holiday's health continued to deteriorate. As a pragmatist, Doc dismissed the notion of miraculous cures. Nevertheless, in May 1887, he set out for Glenwood Springs, Colorado, hoping that the Yampa Hot Springs and Sulphur Vapors might offer some relief. Checking into the upscale Hotel Glenwood, his condition steadily worsened. He spent his final 57 days confined to his hotel bed, delirious for 14 of them. On November 8, 1887, he awoke with clarity and requested a glass of whiskey. Sipping it with enjoyment, he remarked, while gazing at his bare feet, this is funny, and passed away. Holiday died at 10 a.m. on November 8, 1887. He was 36. Despite having come west years earlier, fully aware that his days were numbered, Doc Holliday never envisioned dying in bed. He had often expressed the belief that his demise would be the result of lead poisoning, at the end of a rope, a knife in his ribs, or possibly succumbing to the effects of excessive drinking. The Glenwood Springs Ute Chief of November 12, 1887, wrote in its obituary that Holliday had been baptized in the Catholic Church. This assertion rested on correspondences exchanged between Holliday and his cousin, Sister Mary Melanie, a Catholic nun. However, a thorough search has failed to produce any baptismal records, neither at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Glenwood Springs, nor at the Annunciation Catholic Church in nearby Leadville. Holliday's familial religious background adds another layer to this narrative. Despite his mother's initial affiliation with Methodism, she later embraced her husband's Presbyterian faith. However, a public objection to the Presbyterian doctrine led her to revert to Methodism before her passing, expressing a desire for her son, John, to understand her beliefs. Holliday himself was later to say that he had joined a Methodist church in Dallas. At the end of his life, Holliday had struck up friendships with both a Catholic priest, Father E. T. Downey, and a Presbyterian minister, Rev. W. S. Randolph, in Glenwood Springs. When Holliday passed away, Father Downey was unavailable. 
leading Rev. Randolph to oversee the burial on the very day of Holiday's death at 4 p.m. The ceremony reportedly drew many friends to pay their respects. His obituary, published in the Leadville Carbonate Chronicle on November 14, 1887, stated the following. There is scarcely one in the country who had acquired greater notoriety than Doc Holliday, who enjoyed the reputation of being one of the most fearless men on the frontier, and whose devotion to his friends in the climax of the fiercest ordeal was inextinguishable. It was this, more than any other faculty, that secured for him the reverence of a large circle who were prepared on the shortest notice to rally to his relief. The Glenwood Springs Cemetery is perched on a steep hill, offering a panoramic view of the valley below. However, due to icy conditions on the steep road at the time of his death, he was interred at the hill's base, with plans to relocate his remains once the ice melted. Regrettably, this move never materialized. Many years later, a residential development emerged at the hill's foot, and despite a marker in the cemetery, his actual remains likely rest in someone's backyard. Doc Holliday claimed he almost lost his life a total of eight times. Four attempts were made to hang him, and he was shot five times. It's unclear how many people Holliday took down. A significant portion of Holliday's notorious image was fueled by hearsay and self-promotion, rather than actual events. Despite the rumors, he demonstrated exceptional prowess in both gambling and gunfights, showcasing his skills without being hindered by the challenges posed by tuberculosis. Notably, Holiday was ambidextrous. Contrary to the widespread tales in folklore, there is a lack of contemporaneous newspaper reports or legal documentation verifying the numerous unnamed individuals credited to Holiday's lethal encounters. The only documented instances of his involvement in fatal altercations include the deaths of Mike Gordon in 1879, probably Frank McClory and Tom McClory in Tombstone, possibly Frank Stilwell in Tucson, and William Allen in Colorado. Some scholars argue that Holliday may have encouraged the stories about his reputation, although there is no evidence he did. As we conclude this journey into the fascinating life of Doc Holliday, it's evident that reality often diverges from the myths that surround Old West legends. Doc's story is a tapestry woven with courage, resilience, and a hint of mystery. Separating fact from fiction, we've explored his gambler's skill, his prowess in gunfights, and the ambiguity surrounding his notorious reputation. In the pages of history, Doc Holliday stands not just as a symbol of the Wild West, but as a complex individual whose life unfolded against the backdrop of a tumultuous era. As we bid farewell to this chapter on Doc Holliday, let us appreciate the layers of his character and the indelible mark he left on the landscape of the Old West, a legend whose true story continues to captivate and intrigue. Please like and share if you find the video content interesting and useful. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and comment below so as not to miss the upcoming interesting videos. Thanks for watching.